morning's reading is from Mark chapter 3, verse 25. And, a, and if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Thank you, brother. Good morning. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 25 says, And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now when they said this, when Jesus said this, it actually in its true context, Jesus is saying you can't serve both God and the devil. They're trying to accuse Jesus and his works being of the devil. But whenever I read this scripture, it also fell on my heart whenever I seen the part where it says the house is divided. It made me think about family troubles. It made me think about troubles that go on in the house with amongst our families, even outside of our homes. And how sometimes we can have such troubles go on within our families that it can shake our house so hard that the foundation's probably cracked. And it's probably about ready to fall. And that maybe we could even tempt us to even give up. Give up on our family or even give up on our faith. So this morning what I want to talk to you, what I came here to talk to you about is, is this, does Jesus care? And the short answer is, the, is he does. He certainly does. Does he care about my family problems? Does he know about family problems. Jesus certainly does as well too. Our text will be in John chapter 7 verses 1 through 10. But before I start in John chapter 7, I wanted you to ask you a few questions. Do you have someone in your extended family or in your family that you might call the black sheep? Some might say that I'm the black sheep. But you wonder, do you have someone in your family that way? I mean, someone who has for years caused you and your loved ones grief. You have someone in your family like that. Someone who is who's a little self-centered or, or even ill-mannered at times within your family. Someone who makes family reunions quite difficult to attend. But you still go, but they're there. You put the smile on your face, you try to be the good Christian, but there's that family, that member is there. Do you have heartache in your family somewhere right now? And I'm sure if we would count the toll, we would all answer, yes, there's heartache. There's heartache in every one of our families, if we be honest about it. There's heartache everywhere. Why is that? Because we live in a broken world. There's heartache there. And I want to talk this morning about how it can be related to Christ. Some issue that you just can't seem to resolve. Some person or people who you would love to change so much so, but you, and just to make the problem just go away, but you can't do it. Does that exist in your family? Someone who you spend time with only because you're kin to them and no other reason than that, that you're kin. Do you share the type of blood together? And that's, and that's why. Someone you'd, you'd never be close to otherwise, but, but you are because you're family. I think about when Jesus cares. I, I think about that song. There's a song titled, Does Jesus Care? And in the chorus it says, Oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. He cares. The chorus in that song. Jesus certainly cares. And we can say that Jesus cares because Jesus can relate. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 it says, For we do not have a, a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In all points tempted. And He, Jesus, our high priest, is Jesus. And we have one of those. We have Jesus, our high priest, that can sympathize because in all points. But does that mean all points? Does Jesus know about struggles in his family? And what it feels like to be tied to troubled people with family ties? Does he know what that feels like? Is that one of the points at which he was tested? Most extended families, because members are so different and yet somewhat glued together, have some problems. There are problems in people's families. It's common. It's really in, probably in every one of our families. Some here today have a deep heartache as I go through and describe this, as I say this. There'll be a deep heartache. And I want this sermon to give comfort, to give comfort, and, and a little advice from the life of our Master Jesus. So let's go to our text in, in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Let's learn of Jesus and his family. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. And after these things, as referencing John chapter 6, where a lot of his disciples left him. It wasn't fun to be a disciple of Christ anymore, so they just, they just left him. But what did he continue to do? He continued to walk. 
It says now he walked in Galilee, and, and Galilee is important for this account because Galilee is his home territory. He's amongst family now in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea, and this is important too, because the Jews sought to kill him. Well, he knew if he go that way, the Jews are there and they're going to kill him. So he wanted to avoid that area. So he's walking where home is. He's in his home territory. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And this was a, an important feast. One of the feasts where all male Jews had to come and attend this feast. And they have it recorded in Leviticus chapter 23 to do your home Bible study on about this feast. It was an important feast that had to be observed. That's why there are so many Jews in Judea right now. They're flooding the area to go to this feast. And watch what happens to Jesus. His brothers therefore said to him, and this is his fleshly brothers. These are his brothers. Brothers. Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Here's Jesus' brothers telling him to go on to Judea where all the Jews are. Now, taunting him to risk his life, his brothers are doing. Now, that kind of seems like how brothers kind of behave with one another, but, but that would hurt. You really meant that. They were seeking to kill him, the Jews were, and his brothers tell him to go on. Don't do these in secret. Go on. Go amongst them all. And verse 5 reveals why his brothers were saying this to Jesus. For even his brothers did not believe in him. His own brothers, his own brothers, Flesh and blood did not believe in him. No wonder Jesus described it himself in John chapter 4 and verse 44 when he says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Here he was on home, home ground, his family here. Then Jesus said to them, he responds. What's Jesus say back to his brothers that, that try to taunt him like this? He says, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Jesus trying to encourage, him, encourage his brothers to the salvation. Your time is always ready. Follow the Savior. Follow the Son of God. Follow the Father. Do His will. Did we see Jesus fire back with ridicule or hatred or meanness? No, that's not what we've seen. But we did see what He tried to, tried to do here. He says, my time's not yet ready. It's not His time yet to die. It's too soon. His death is to come on the cross to save all of our souls, including His brothers right there. His time wasn't ready. But your time is always ready, and your time is always ready. It always is ready while you're still living and breathe. Your time is ready. Your time is now. The world cannot hate you, Jesus says, but it hates me because I testify of it that is, its works are evil. Now, people tend to not like you whenever you tell them what they're doing is wrong, and Jesus did a lot of that. And they said that the world hated him because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast, he says, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now, Jesus still had to attend this feast, but he wasn't there yet. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. And when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. He had to go in secret. It wasn't his time to die yet. His brothers didn't believe in him. His brothers were about wishing him dead there to go on up to Judea to face these men that wanted to kill him. The Feast of Tabernacles, it, it came the last of September or the first week of October, and it lasted eight days to commemorate the dwelling in tents during the wilderness, which is documented in Numbers chapter 8. Josephus, the historian, he called it, he called it the one of the three feasts that every male was obligated to attend, and one of, one of the greatest feasts Josephus named it as. You see that there is some strife here with Jesus and his brethren, as you can see it here. Jesus really loved his mother, of course. But there were apparently problems between he and his brothers. Jesus was the oldest child in his family. And his siblings are named. We can go to Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, and we can see about the names of Jesus' brothers. It says this, it says, Is it not the carpenter, the son of Mary, referring to Jesus, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Now, this is a different Judas. This is not Judas Iscariot. But this is James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon are his brothers. And listen on. And are not his sisters here with us? Say so they were offended at him. So Jesus had brothers and Jesus had sisters. Could you imagine being a brother or a sister to the Lord, to the Messiah, the Christ? 
you imagine what it would be like growing up next to Jesus? That would be different now, wouldn't it? It would be different. If pond, that's, that's worth pondering that's worth pondering on. I wonder if there was some type of contention at time between some of the brothers of Jesus being the Son of God and you're growing up next to, next to that, the Messiah. Our passage makes a contrast between Jesus' brethren and Jesus' disciples. You notice that how it says that his brothers therefore said to him, and his brothers said, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples, making a contrast between the two. His brothers were not his, members of his disciples, were not one of his disciples. And they made that clear by saying that in their statement, not including themselves as being supporters of Jesus. They didn't even believe Jesus was God's son, it says in verse 5, that they did not believe now here's the implication with that. It goes even deeper. What does that say about Mary whenever the brothers did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God? We don't know what happened to Joseph. Most say that Joseph has died at this point, they believe. But we might wonder if perhaps Mary didn't tell her, son, her other sons the clear proofs about Jesus as in childhood. Well, I, I don't believe that would be so because why would she want to not influence her own flesh and blood to serve the Savior of the world, Jesus? She knew who Jesus is. She knew that he is a Savior. He's the Messiah. The angel told her these things. She proclaimed it to Elizabeth whenever John the Mercer leaped in her womb and Luke recorded that. Of course she told her children about Jesus. She would tell them about him and what he was coming to be, him being the Messiah. It says that they, that they believe Mary lied about the virgin birth by denying that Jesus isn't the Son of God. That's the implication with that. See the strife in the family. It was there too. It was even in Jesus' family. It says that they, they believe that Mary also lied about the, the, Jesus' first miracle in John chapter 2, when he turned the water into grape juice and the wine, that they didn't believe that either, or that she herself was even deceived. You see the strife there in the, in the family. There it existed in Christ's family. Oh, don't we all wish that Jesus had the perfect life that with, amongst his family? He had it rough with the world. They murdered him on a cross. I would just like to see that he had a good family. He, he, he had a good, good siblings, that he had a good relationship with, the, with his brothers and his sisters. But that's just, not, that's just not true according to the text. They did not believe him. There's a consequence. But they, they didn't believe in him when Mary knew it was true. We see in John chapter 7 a strife between the Lord's brothers and him. But it didn't also ex just exist between Mary and her... Did it also exist between Mary and her unbelieving sons as well? Well, of course, I, I, I believe that it probably did. Whenever they deny that Jesus is the Son of God, they deny the virgin birth. And they accuse Mary of being an adulterer. What a terrible thing to accuse your mother of. We must struggle with the fact that Jesus also dying on the cross, that he gave care of his mother to John and not to his brothers. John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that's John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. His brothers were still living. Yet he picked a man who, who was not blood kin to care for his mother. That was what was important to him, is that he at least picked somebody. It didn't matter if they were blood, but he picked somebody that was a disciple. Someone that followed the Lord. Someone that followed God. That's who he trusted his mother with. That's who he trusted his family with. It's also who we should trust our own families with. Trust him with a Christian, with a Christian, more so than anyone else. Had there been so many disparaging remarks made about Mary that Jesus couldn't bear to leave his dear mother without protection, we wonder? Had they just become so estranged that the brothers were just nowhere to be found, we also wonder. Now, was this strife also behind the statement which Jesus had in Matthew chapter 12, and verse 46 and following, remember whenever they came to him wishing to speak to him, and he teaches us something. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside, seeking to speak to him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, Here are my mother 
and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. If you're this morning doing the will of the Father as a Christian, you're a part of the family. You're a part of the family with Christ. That's what he is saying here. And that's who our family is. Our family is the brotherhood. Our family is the church. That's our family. Even Christ says it. That is the family. That. Not just flesh and blood, but beyond that. The blood that, that able to cover a multitude of sins. Jesus. That blood. Jesus goes on to tell us about relationships in the family in Matthew 10 and 36. If you go back a couple chapters. And he says, A man's enemies will be those of his own household. How true that can be sometimes. And how hurtful that can be sometimes. Oh boy, the devil, he knows all the tricks on how to discourage you to the point of quitting and giving up. And the devil fights dirty. He fights so dirty that he'll use your own family even to compromise truth. And to depart from the actual family, from the church. Making them enemies. But Jesus has tender empathy. We can always go to Jesus' example that he gives us. And it gives us hope. Jesus understands my family problems. He's been through them before. We go back to that scripture on, he, scripture on Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In all points? Surely he wasn't tempted in every conceivable sin. He wasn't tempted to neglect his wife because Jesus wasn't married. But in all categories of sin, Jesus was certainly tempted. We can see it even in his temptation in Matthew chapter 4 of the categories of sin which Satan tempted him. But in John, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, these categories of sin, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not the, of the Father, but is of the world. We see that. Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Yet without sin. That's important. Because yet without sin, that's a difference that we must note between the relationship in Jesus' family and the relationship in our own family. Jesus was completely faultless in his family struggles. That is seldom true today. Usually in a family discomfort or estrangement, there's fault on both sides. But I'm not saying that the fault is equal on both sides. I'm no way saying that. That would be just as rare to say that the fault is equal. But in learning from Jesus, on this point, we need to admit the difference between us and him, that Jesus was faultless and Jesus was perfect, and we can learn from him. So that being said, while we do this so we learn from him, what, why, why do we have this five-minute conversation between Jesus and his brothers given to us in John chapter 7? Well, it'd be perhaps so that we never doubt God when we face family strife, that whenever we're there, when we're in Jesus' shoes there, that we won't doubt God at that point. God also didn't keep His only begotten Son from the potential heartache of family strife. Why should I expect any different if Jesus also faced it? And also, it's an encouragement to know that He went through it, He faced it, and He, pre and he prevailed. And we can too, with His help. The potential exists then and now in families because of sin. That's, that's, that's why we have the strife in our families, is the, is the sin, that broken world. Never wonder if Jesus cares for you. Never wonder that, because he certainly does. Remember we said in Hebrews 4 and 15 that we have a high priest and that he has the ability to sympathize because in all points he was tempted and yet without sin. In all points. He's been there. He knows your heartache. He feels it with you. Paul had felt the heartache when many had abandoned him in 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17. Again, this letter being his last while he was in imprisonment, getting ready to face death, ready to depart this world. But he says, At my first defense, no one stood with me. No one. But all forsook me. All forsook me. May it not be charged against them. That's a great attitude to have. That would be an attitude of Christ. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. The Lord is with you whenever you go through families, difficulties, and strifes, so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. We see how Paul, how he says that the Lord was with him and the Lord strengthened him. That way he can continue to do the Lord's will. And that's what's important because that's, that's what Jesus was doing. 
He continued to do God's will. And, you know, Jesus, he continues to extend hope for us. And, th- and this is so simple, but, but yet it's so, so profound. Yes, Jesus gives us hope. And he gives us hope through these scriptures here and with his relationship through his, with his family. And that gives us hope. Jesus shows me that I, can, that I can act right when my family members are acting wrong. And Jesus has always did the will of the Father, like I said. And, and John 5 and 30, his own, his own voice, I can of myself do nothing. Jesus says this. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will. He says that his judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. His will was to do the will of the Father. That's what his food was even. That's what his nourishment was, to do the will of the Father. And that's how he was, he was right. But I have some amazing news to give you about Jesus' family. Some absolute amazing news. Because Jesus performed the will of God his entire time. That he marched all the way up that hill of Golgotha and gave his life on the cross for us, the will of God, and God resurrected him again. His brothers eventually believed in him and obeyed God. We go to Acts in chapter 1. We can see this here that it rings true. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection have already occurred and his ascension had occurred as well. And immediately after. And when they had entered... They went up in the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And with his brothers. We can only assume what made the brothers come around. I believe it must have been the resurrection from the dead. Sufficient proof to them that their brother was indeed God the Son from that point. And that all accomplished through Jesus continuing to perform God's will. There's hope in your family too. Of course, I know it doesn't always work out, but there is hope in your family. You can't pray hard enough that God will force your loved one to do what's right. But you can pray for wisdom to be the kind of person who will see the best opportunities and influence them. You can pray to God this prayer. Help me to see when the door of opportunity opens. And Lord, then help me to have the courage to walk through it. And then also focus on Jesus' living example that he's given us, especially here in his interaction with his brothers. I must remember the great relationship fact, though, when we contemplate this. If I want to heal relationship problems, I can't set out to change other people. I must first seek to change myself first. Because Jesus was perfect. I'm not. I must first seek it within. How did Jesus change his brothers? Remember he had the power to heal the sick, the return sight to the blind, to raise men from the dead. He could take coins out of fishes' mouths and turn water into wine. How did he change those who apparently caused such problems in his family? Did he force them by miracle? He did God's will, period. That's what he did. He continued to be faithful to the Father himself. He didn't make his his life work to fight with them or to pursue them. He didn't write them letters every day or camp out at their doorstep. He loved them, was sad for them, encouraged them when opportunities arose. But he went on with his life devoted to his Father in heaven. And that is what you must do when you have problems in the family, troubles in the family. Do you have grown children who seem determined to discover new ways to hurt you more? Do you have a spouse who has become bitter and hateful and disinterested and making your marriage better and and telling you that there's no possible way to make your marriage any better and to prove this situation? Do you have that? Do you have parents who treat you mean or spitefully? Do you have a brother or sister whose greed for inheritance has robbed your family of warm affection? The answer is is the same for all. You can't fix everything, but you can do, and what you must do is to live a faithful Christian life. If you do, you'll know that you're doing your best to treat them fairly and good, and you'll know that that whether or not they come to come around or accept you is on them, because you can sleep peacefully at night. You've done your best. Jesus taught us how to work through difficult family problems. And when, you might ask, did he teach us that? 
Well, of course, through his example that we've just seen, but also through every word in the New Testament that he's given us. He tells us to control our temper. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, Ephesians 4 and 26. He tells us to be nice and forgive people, Ephesians 4 and 32. He says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. He tells us to do not lie and to tell the truth in Romans 12 and 17. Recompense the no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Do good even to bad people, Jesus tells us in Romans 12 and 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And also to practice non-retaliation, Jesus teaches us. Matthew 5, 38 and 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. You don't have to think about this too hard. It's, it's a simple fact. The best spouse is a faithful Christian. The best brother or sister is a faithful Christian. The best cousin is a faithful Christian. You can take their, that information to the bank because that is sure and that is true. Most believe that James, the brother of Jesus, the writer of James, observe how he begins his letter in James. James a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus' brother. People can change. You can't change others, but what needs adjustment in your attitude, what needs adjusted is that maybe adjustment in our attitudes or within ourselves. You can certainly change yourself. Are you a Christian right now living a devoted life to your master? Are you what you should be? Are you a Christian? Are you part of Christ's family? Are you his brother? What's declared to us in the Hebrews writer says that Christ is our brother. Are you one of his? And how is that possible? How do you become a Christian? You've got to hear the truth. You've got to hear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to this sin-cursed world and died for our sins on the cross and was resurrected again on the third day. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And believe in Jesus and Son's God. You need to, you need to believe that. Jesus says his own words, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. We need to repent of our sins. Acts 17, 30 gives us a great example. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Jesus also taught repentance. Confess faith in Christ. We need that good confession that you believe in Jesus as God's Son. Romans 9, 10, 9 and 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And it doesn't end there. We need to be buried with him in baptism also. First Peter 3 and 21 says, The like figure weren't even baptism, doth also now save us. Not putting the, away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also see it's for the remission of sins in Acts 2 and 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul was told by Ananias, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and 16. And after you've done that, you've put on Christ, you need to remain faithful. James 1.12, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. I pray if you need to respond this morning, that you'll come and, and have a seat on the first pew, that if you need to have Christ put on, you need to be, we'll have your sins washed away in the grave of baptism. We do that this morning. You can be added to the family. You can be added to the church. If you've gone astray and wish to be returned back to the fold, you wish to be returned back to the church, you wish to, to make that con public confession before all, please do so while we stand and while we sing.